we're talking retail with a very special guest on this Consumer Goods Edition of Industry Focus. Greetings, fools. Sean O'Reilly here at Fool Headquarters in Alexandria, Virginia. It is Tuesday, March 15th, 2016. Joining me in studio is the Brutus to my Caesar on this Ides of March is Mr. Vincent Shen. And joining us via phone for interview week is our very special guest, Brian Dodge, Executive Vice President of Communications and Strategic Initiatives at the Retail Industry Leaders Association. Good morning, Brian. We can't thank you enough for joining us uh, this morning. Good morning, guys, and thanks for having me. So, Vince, I uh, can't believe we got uh, we actually pulled together an interview at the last minute. <laughs> well, no, nah, not too bad in the last minute, but I'm actually super excited about our guest. Brian, thanks again for joining us on the show. Um, you know, we really like the fact, or we just think it's great that, uh, you know, your organization has a lot of uh, relationships with companies that we talk about all the time. We were looking at some of the members. Um, you have a large Rolodex, sir. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> We're very proud of who we represent. Some great companies. Uh, you know, these you know, these are companies we cover very often during our show. So uh, it'll be really great to to get you know some a bit of an inside perspective from you. Uh, but you know, before we get there, could you give us a, a brief description of what uh, of what you know the, the retail industry leader association is about? What you do there? Sure. Uh, so we, uh, as we uh, have sort of alluded to already, we represent the largest retailers operating in the U.S. And like many trade associations based in D.C., we have a heavy focus on advocacy, but we also bring the industry together, the executives from the industry, uh, to talk about kind of operational issues that they're facing, whether it's in the supply chain or asset protection, finance, tax, and so forth, and and bring those executives together to identify best practices, trends, uh, in ways where a collaborative solution uh, may advance the industry more broadly. Um, So we're really excited about uh, the 80 or so retailers that we work with, all of which are over a billion dollars in annual sales, most of which are uh, public companies. Uh, And uh, it's a dynamic industry. It's a lot of fun uh, sort of observing these companies as they evolve and adapt to economic challenges, changes in demographics, all the things that I think your your listeners are are also keeping track of. Sure thing. Uh, so, you know, based on that, you mentioned a lot of trends and, ter- and best practices among uh, among the retailers. And uh, you know, recently this earnings season is kind of winding down. We've heard a lot of the results coming from retailers reporting their fourth quarter, which of course encompasses the very important holiday shopping season. So, are there what are some major takeaways that uh, you know some of your member companies have take uh, have had with overall spending, uh, you know, consumer habits, the different platforms that that shoppers are using to interact with these companies or so uh, you know any comments you have there would be great yeah sure so i think you know it's important to look first kind of at the macro level <clears throat> and there i don't you can you can twist the data any way that you'd like to but i think what you'll find on a macro level is the consumer spending is largely flat to modestly growing over time and so for, for retailers, that is a complicated scenario in which to operate. Uh, there isn't robust growth to, uh, to uh, buttress uh, financial gains for individual companies. And so it sort of turns back on really effective and efficient execution in, in order to gain share from a very slow-growing economy. And so I think retailers are, are sort of you know, recognizing the environment with their, with their, in which they're operating and focusing on the things that they can control. How do they make sure those very simple maxims are achieved, which is, you know, have the right product in the right place at the right time at the right price? Um, and sounds simple. Uh, obviously, it's very complicated. Uh, but uh, but that's, I think that's how re- retailers are looking at it. How can we improve our execution uh, so that our customers uh, stay our customers and others are attracted to our stores or our, our online or mobile platforms in order to find the products that they're looking for. That's really the focus. It's simple uh, in, in a statement, but very complicated in execution. Okay, and then you know it's funny. It's funny that you mentioned that just because you know uh, I think it was last week or two weeks ago. You know we were talking about the theater, the movie theater industry. You know, actually thinking about AMC, Carmike, and how they are kind of facing something similar. Where you know the ticket sales set a record in 2015 in terms of dollar value, but you know actual ticket volume is stagnant. And so we see how uh, over, you know, like you mentioned, consumer spending flat or low growth. But I guess you know one of the 
one of the uh, brighter points there that a lot of companies allude to is how online shopping, e-commerce, growing at you know potentially at even ten times the rate of consumer spending overall during the fourth quarter. Um, so, what are how are companies thinking about that? You know, we have some obviously more traditional retailers, brick and mortar operations, moving, trying to get better in terms of their omni-channel strategy. Uh, you know, what else are you seeing there? What what kind of innovation uh, are, are companies kind of adopting in that space to better compete against these pure play online retailers? Yeah, sure. So I think uh, I think it's important first to sort of break out the fact that certainly pure play online retailers are are doing very well. Uh, but I think the dot coms for some of the traditional referred to as brick and mortar retailers are, are also doing well. And the investment that retailers have made in their dot com, but probably more broadly in their omni channel, is starting to pay off. Um, the the there's no doubt that the growth. Uh, you know, we all carry a, a high powered computer in our pockets. Our ability to access uh, retail items for purchase is, you know, ubiquitous. We can do it at any time, at any place. Um, you know, for for our members, I think we we recognize that having stores is a competitive advantage. Um, people like to be able to see and touch products before they purchase them. The challenge is making sure that once they've done that in a store, that they actually make the purchase there. Uh, and if they choose to take that information and go home and search online for a better price, that they find uh, an equal competitive price uh, on the, the you know, traditional retailers.com. That's difficult. Uh, stores are expensive. Uh, employees, uh, there's more employees in a, in a traditional retail environment. So retailers kind of grapple with that to figure out how they can reduce costs elsewhere so they can make sure that those prices are competitive uh, once they get online. The uh, you know the challenge of uh, of Omni is is the sort of the great Rubik's cube of today. How do we figure out? Uh, you know, you have to manage effectively three, if not more, platforms to make the same sale. Uh, that obviously adds cost, but how do you do it in an efficient manner so that the whole experience for the consumer is uh, a great one? And uh, I think some are are getting uh, are making strong advancements uh, because the omnichannel environment offers a great marketing cross marketing opportunities um, that you know the pure play online folks wouldn't otherwise have. So I think it's part of a, a long evolution. I think um, you know we these, these terms like omnichannel have a tendency to pop into the to the uh, to the retail vocabulary, and then with the expectation that they'll fade out over time as it becomes becomes sort of standard operating procedure. Uh, I think we're going to be talking about omnichannel for a while because we're a long way from perfecting it. Um, but I think it once we do, I think you're going to see uh, the consumer experience will will blossom, and hopefully, when we get to that point, we'll see more <laughs> robust growth in consumer spending so that retailers themselves can take advantage of that. So, what do you expect to see over the next few years as retail evolves? Is it just the omni-channel strategy? Is it um, is it just getting started, or do you think it's going to be more slow and gradual? And you know, you're talking about 10, 20 years, they'll actually have perfected the the getting consumers to buy in store, whether it's on the phone or at the cashier. Yeah, you know, if this is a football game, I don't think we'd be at the end of the first quarter yet. Uh, I think we've got an awful long way to go, and uh, you know, there's in terms of just the under the underlying technologies, there's lots of innovation that needs to happen. We also have a regulatory space that is largely undefined uh, as it relates to a lot of this stuff, and so uh, you know, is that that big of a deal? Well, I think it is, especially when you get to uh, you know some of the the uses of uh, analytics and store tracking, things of those sort. Where you know businesses are just not yet sure how they can implement them, knowing the great potential that they have because of regulatory ambiguity. Um, you know the loudest voices are ones who are raising concerns, and so there's a lot of education that has to happen in that space in order to you know give businesses the comfort that they need in order to utilize some of these things. So yeah, we're very early on in this process, and I, and I think you know we should all expect to, that it's going to take some time for it to be worked out, but for Consumers, there's enormous opportunity. I mean, the the whole lifeblood of retail is adapting to the demands of the consumers. So, as consumers are more vocal and demonstrative in the way that they want to shop and uh, want businesses to interact with them, you're going to see retailers responding to that. And it's a it's a really exciting time. And what can't be lost in this is there's a lot of focus on you know millennials entering their prime consumption uh, age, uh, there's another generation right behind them uh, that is 
uh, you know, equally as um, uh, maybe maybe not as large in size, but um, as powerful to dictate the kind of patterns of retailers and businesses at general, in general, excuse me, uh, for for years to come. So it's an exciting time. Those darn kids have no idea what I went through on AOL <laughs> in 1998. They do not appreciate right. downloading a song in eight minutes. Um, really, taking a step back to what you said just before that, um, does this lend itself to you know the 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 age old tale of how Borders was basically just a showroom for Amazon.com and books and everything, and that obviously didn't go so well for them. Does that lend itself to a future of retail where I don't want to say there's more haggling going on? But, you know, I can go into a store and, you know, I'd, you know, at Macy's or just any department store or whatever and be like, hey, listen, a very similar Oxford shirt is on Amazon or just something else for $10 cheaper. What are we going to do here? I mean, w- is there anything else that can be done by retailers? Well, I, I think the days of the showroom are sort of, that was a really popular term a few years ago. I think you're seeing less of that because retailers have a much better sense of where, what the price competition is. Uh, but probably more specifically, what kind of price competition do their customers, are they able to access instantly? Uh, so the pricing is becoming, you know, I think more consistent. Mm-hmm. Um, but inventories so I, are coming down and they're just having giant distribution centers or something. Well, yeah, I mean, so that's going back to the omni-channel. So the advantage for some of the some of the large, uh, you know, pure play online folks is their ability to deliver product, you know, as quickly as possible. Uh, same day, next day. I mean, that's one of the more attractive things that they offer as the price is the sort of delta between traditional retail prices and pure play online prices evaporates. Um, and in that space, retailers have a great advantage that they can take advantage of, uh, but are struggling to figure out exactly how to do so, which is if you have a distribution model that recognizes that your stores can be fulfillment centers, then your ability to deliver same day, next day is is, is really high. Um, and so how do they, you know, as part of one of the many omni-channel uh, challenges that they're facing is how do they do that? How do they figure out how to apportion space within a store to to distribute and accept uh, distribute product and accept returns, um, and you know how do they figure out exactly which ones should be responsible for fulfillment in an area and which ones should be exclusively for um, you know the merchandise that's on sale there for consumers coming into the store. So I think there's a there's a really really great opportunity there for the you know the brick and mortar retailers. And the one thing I, I think I would just sort of I should carefully say here when it comes to stores is I think stores are an advantage and I think we're seeing more and more chatter acknowledging that. But there's a degree to which having too many stores or stores in the wrong locations is a drag. And so you're seeing a lot of retailers making changes there in order to make sure that a store that maybe was in the right place 20 years ago um, isn't there simply because of inertia uh, and that they're placing their stores in the right places. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, you touched on some points there that uh, you know that we have seen personally, not only in some of our you know content from our writers on Fool. dot com, but that we have talked about here. Uh, you know, in terms of some people saying that you know, a Walmart or a Target with so many uh, actual physical locations can turn that into an advantage, like you said, in terms of becoming its own distribution center. And then we've also had talked about how Best Buy, for example, is trying to innovate and in, in getting away from showrooming, for example, by improving their customer service, the knowledge that their sales staff have on the ground floor, and creating some of these like store-within-a-store concepts to attract customers and build, in foot, build up foot traffic. Are there, any other, are there any other innovations or strategies that you've seen companies take? Are there like st- any startups or um, like VCs even like pushing certain ideas that you think might be a, a big change five ten years down the line even in terms of payments or anything like that. Well, you mentioned payments. There's a, a, a whole world of innovation going on in payments mm-hmm. that's pretty exciting to see. And I think you know retailers are are largely in the driver's seat because um, you know the, the ubiquity of acceptance is uh, you know a key driver to what mobile platforms will be successful. Um, so that's a really exciting space, and I uh, wouldn't, uh, if I were a betting man, I still wouldn't place a bet on this one because it's way too difficult to get the read of. In terms of retailers making innovations, I think we've seen a, a spike in the last couple of years. 
of retailers starting their own innovation labs or accelerators. And while, you know, I think some of the things that have spun out of them um, so far are a little far-fetched or hard to sort of get your head around, um, I think there's great opportunity in them. Uh, And I think it's exciting that retailers are making that individual capital expenditure to have uh, innovation going on within their company. Um, you know, we just had, uh, you know, at Rela, we, we host an annual meeting of the CEOs of our member companies, which we had in January. And it's a two-day two agenda. And uh, the agenda was overwhelmingly dominated by the topic of innovation. Um, you know, our, our CEOs help us set that agenda so that it's something that they're thinking about a lot. So it's innovation uh, related to, you know, how they um, – uh, conduct their operations. It's supply chain innovation. It's product innovation. You know, there's no, uh, I don't think, limit right now to where uh, retailers' minds are in terms of ways that they can improve. Um, you know, their their execution. Going back to the point I made earlier, that you know, as as growth is being is flat, you know, the that the importance of execution couldn't be couldn't be higher. So, uh, you know, specific examples. You, you name the store within a store. That's clearly becoming a popular model. Um, you know, I, I don't know if I have any any others to, to point to right now, but I would say stay tuned. Maybe within a year or two, we're going to see um, some new uh, examples roll out that'll be really interesting. Awesome. Uh, so, you know, wrapping up here, uh, we had two more topics that we kind of wanted to touch on. Uh, uh, the first one, actually, Sean, if you want to Yeah, hear so uh, on a recent show, we talked about, uh, the, I thought it was a big announcement, Whole Foods was teaming up with Solar City, um, you know, and obviously these two firms are kind of in with the uh, the conscious capitalism movement and all that, and the basically the team up was uh, Solar City's installing a hundred uh, solar panels on a hundred Whole Foods stores. Um, are there, and as I understand it, uh, Retail Industry Leaders Association, you guys have got kind of a, uh, a robust sustainability program a- aimed at helping companies reduce their energy consumption and all that stuff. Um, is this, I mean, is this like the first pitch of a, a, a big game where retailers are going to start going in this direction? Yeah, I think I think our members have recognized for a long time, and I've been uh, doing this for about uh, nine years. So in my nine years here, I, I think I've uh, I can comfortably say that our members view sustainability as good business. Right? Sustainability generally has multiple effects. One is reducing costs, which is very good for the business, very good for its customers and, and investors as well. But it has a socially conscious and positive impact on the environment as well. And so we've led a program now for seven years uh, to help uh, the industry kind of share practices and identify ways where they can accelerate their uh, uh, incorporation of sustainability within their retail uh, operations. One of the things that I'm most excited about right now is a program that we have um, around energy management. And your reference to the to the Whole Foods and uh, Solar City example is is a perfect segue to that. You know, I think retailers, uh, our members have identified that there's about $20 billion uh, spent every year by retailers on energy costs, big number. Mm -hmm. And within that, there's an estimated $3 billion of, we'll call it low-hanging fruit, uh, savings that could be accessed relatively easily through solar panel investments, solar panels, and things of that sort. Um, and so the program that we've put together is to help uh, our members tap into that savings by better understanding, um, you know, the expectation of CFOs when they're making a pitch internally, working with not all of our members own all of their property they, they lease. And so working with tenants, excuse me, with, with uh, the, the, the owners of the property to, um, you know, to, to work on common solutions that could reduce their their uh, energy investment, and then uh, identifying ways to incorporate uh, renewable energy uh, at every turn. And so uh, we're excited about that. Department of Energy, U.S. Department of Energy, recently recognized the program as exceptional and awarded us $750,000 to expand the reach of the program. And we're really excited about what we, what we can accomplish over the next couple of years with it. Awesome. And um, you know, this last question, I think it's because it's outside of Sean and, I, and my expertise. It's not something we touch on as often uh, uh, during our usual episodes of industry focus, is, is around the legal and re- regulatory framework. Are there any um, issues like around I don't know, even like cybersecurity? Uh, you know, we had the tie-up at the West Coast ports last year that impacted a lot mm-hmm. of retailers. 
in terms of their inventory levels and things. Like that. Are there any issues in that regulatory legal framework that are coming up that retailers are focusing on that investors might want to know? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to mention two real quickly. The first is uh, trade. Uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, is getting a lot of news coverage right now. Um, it is an enormous op- opportunity for businesses in the U.S., uh, both importers and exporters. The uh, Peterson Institute estimates that um, the TPP could increase uh, consumer income uh, by reducing costs by $131 billion dollars. Um, for retail specifically, the reduction in the duties on apparel um, would net uh, $932 million in duty savings in year one of the TPP. So we're in a political environment, presidential election year. There's lots of comments being made about the the harmful effects of trade, but the benefits of trade are enormous. Uh, investors, consumers, and businesses should all care about this and should be pushing that the TPP be signed uh, as soon as possible. The other important thing, and it ties up to the to the TPP and the movement of goods, is the importance of uh, resolving enormous congestion problems at America's ports. Um, it's not a particularly sexy issue that gets a lot of attention, but we have choke points that are access points in America, and that's a problem for, for everybody. It increases costs. It limits the effectiveness of uh, businesses who are trying to export their goods globally. Until we get our arms wrapped around the labor issues at ports, operational and infrastructure issues, we're going to be at a disadvantage to the rest of the world. Uh, and so we've got uh, some key ports around the country. We need to figure out how to uh, get them more efficient, get them uh, get, uh, more modern uh, infrastructure, and uh, get the, the goods flowing more smoothly. So uh, keep key step in, in solving that problem is raising awareness, and I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to do just that. You bet, Mr. Dodge. We cannot thank you enough for your time. Uh, I can't wait to have you on again. And uh, great. that is it for us. Have a great day. Terrific. Thank you so much. And if you're a loyal listener and have questions or comments, we would love to hear from you. Just email us at industryfocus at fool.com. Again, that's industryfocus at fool.com. And as always, people on this program may have interests in the stocks that they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against those stocks, so don't buy or sell anything based solely on what you hear in this program. For Vincent Shen, I am Sean O'Reilly. Thanks for listening, and Fool on! Fool on!